hurt. Yeah. So I need to cancel work on Tuesday and go golfing? Yes. If you're going to golf, it's going to be because it's going to be it's noon every day. That's nice. I do. That's going to be bad. Huh? Oh, I do. Check this out. Oh, Thursday has partially sun, but then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the I may have to do that. So this book is something that was created for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation back in 2017. And it is a beautiful book. You, I, and you can just, you know, I wish I could just send it home with everybody so you could just page through it. You're going to see some of the things that are in this book. But like it'll give pictures. Here, I'll just do an example. So like this, you look at this uh, this object. What is the big deal with that? Well, I don't know what it is. But there's stunning pictures. But then it explains each thing. Um, and there is some really cool stuff. You see some of the old flyers in Luther and mm -hmm. and um, his his old some of the original. Uh, you know some of the like the edicts and the you know. This is one on the peasants' uprisings. Yeah. Um, that, so anyway, come in anytime. I'm just going to leave it in here. You can you can come in anytime and enjoy it. Here, I'll give that back to you. I have a quick one that I'm running around with. Um, Timothy Winger recommended that one, and it is it is by chapter his life, but it also gives each town where those events happen. So every place we're going, I can look and see what actually happened there. And then it'll give, like it has the peasant war things and a lot of probably stuff that we'll be hearing. It's very well, I guess, um, researched. Wow. So it has photographs too. And it has well, a map. Not enough photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely want to take I, a look I at that. He said if he had to choose one, one, that would be the one that he chose. So. Speaking of the peasant sports, you mentioned John Mark's presentation. So yeah, John Mark's like, presentation, which we I think we talked about last week, is going to be, I forget what here. Oh, so that's right, you weren't here. I, I think, I forget which day it is going to be. It's Sunday. Sunday morning. So there's about an hour and a half, two hour slot in the morning, and we're going to have a special lecture, presentation, discussion, conversation with uh, Nick, Jean Marc, who is a very close friend to the Hawks and an expert on lots of things with the Reclamation. But I think we're going to focus in on the Peasants War, I believe. Correct? Yes. Yeah. And he is a Lutheran. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, good. Uh, hello to everybody who's watching the recording uh, of this, unless they are trying to jump into the one I sent out last week. But I sent out, you got a new email from me, right? correct? And that one I know I made sure has this Zoom account and not the one I had to use last Tuesday. So hopefully somebody will text me or something if, yeah. if I uh, got the wrong one. Yeah. Okay, so let's share up on the screen and let's rock and roll, as they say. Okay, so um, we're front loading, as you know. Something you're you're going to hear us talk about the Holy Roman Empire. There it is. Okay, and that's kind of the Holy Roman Emperor <clears throat> Empire with. The areas where an elector was from, and that's modern Germany and modern Europe. So you can kind of see, you know, off the left is France. It's not part of it. And Spain, even though Emperor Charles had Spanish troops, so he, there, there was connection. Charles defeated the Schmalkald League. Um, but uh, anyway, so that just kind of helps you put, you've got Austria, Germany, and the part of that Germany today would have been more known as Saxony, probably back then. Um, Not much of that isn't Germany in the day. When you look at it, a big hunk. Way yeah. into Italy. Yeah, way a big hunk, yes. Um, was part of the Holy Roman Empire. So the Czech Republic, Austria, Switzerland, what most of what we know as Italy today, uh, I don't know about, whoops. 
don't know about Belgium. Yeah, I guess that Bel Belgium. what we know of Belgium yeah. and Netherlands yeah. were all part of oh. that. Yeah. But, but the whole Germany, what they called Germany then. What we they call today Spanish Germany Spanish. was completely yeah. a part of the Holy Roman Empire. And and it encompassed most of more, it. Yeah, yeah most more, 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 more than Germany you're seeing there. Correct. Was, yeah. Charles the, was Charles V the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire? Yes. At the time of Luther. Of Luther. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Where was he located? Um, that's a great question. I got the sense that he was, Beijing. he has uh, Spanish roots, Ooh. which is interesting uh, from what I remember. But I just remember reading that he took his Spanish troops in and conquered the, the so, so the, the Schmalkald League. But so I don't know where he was based. Good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's Charles. You'll see pictures of him, Pope Leo. Um, I, I just reminding you of the people, Frederick the Wise, the emperor at the beginning. I'm not the emperor, the elector who protected Luther at the beginning of his his life, um, or at the beginning of the Reformation. There, there would be, by the way, there'll be two others. There's John. <sighs> Um, something John the Steadfast. There's two other electors that will be in charge of Saxony where Luther is during Luther's life. Um, Frederick the Wise dies, I forget, I think maybe 1525, I forget. John Bugenhagen, Luther's pastor. Um, so that's that's a good person for you just to continue to remember and think about Philip Melanchthon, Luther's right hand man, um, big part of the Reformation. There's um, of course, there are going to be lots of tensions with the way Philip Melanchthon wanted things to go and Luther wanted to go. You'll see that in a quote I put before you. These are some of the more radical reformers, Andreas Bodenstein, Karlstadt. Um, and uh, this is Thomas Munzer, who was an even more radical reformer. Um, and uh, And so... We talked about the Peasants' War last Tuesday, but I want to get before you another important figure, and this is Erasmus of Rotterdam. And uh, he was the big, he was the biggest challenger to Luther in all actuality. And actually, Luther, let's, let's read what Luther has to say here about Erasmus. Moreover, I praise him. He, so this is a letter he's writing. I think this is might be the introduction to the... Um, the introduction to the uh, bond, what's called as the, bo the bondage of the will or whatever is the, the writing, but this is, so Luther's writing to Erasmus, who, and Erasmus was a great scholar. He created the, you will probably get a chance to see one of these. Um, so Erasmus was Right in line with Luther and Melanchthon, in that going back to the sources, that this kind of renaissance of we're going to go to the original sources. And so Erasmus took the best Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and he brought them all together into one. So it kind of brought them all together. Oh, we got, we're passing around. Yes. Yeah, you missed it. It was right there next oh. to you. We'll bring it back. We'll About bring it back. Erasmus. Yes. Uh, make sure you pin down John Mark about that. He was on the board of this humanitarian library in Alsace. Yes. And most of Erasmus' writings are collected there. Wow. And, and John Mark knows a lot about Erasmus. I wonder if he can, can he ever, uh, can, does he ever get permission to take any of the oh, yeah, of course. things? No, oh, oh, take it. it. Then, <laughs> you can touch it and handle it, though, if you really are in the end. Well, you, might you have to be in the end crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some other time. Anyway, can he like? Can he take Erasmus's New Testament yeah. right? <laughs> out of the museum? Thank he has that there. there. I've That's seen great. it. Great. Thank you. It'll be more my style. The there garden. you go. I've done enough. Um. Okay. So. So this is who Erasmus is. It's important you know this name. Um, he was a humanist. He was he was very much a supporter of Luther at the beginning because he felt he was very disgusted with the corruption in the church and the you know the lack of you know zeal in the clergy and he wanted to see those kinds of reforms. But. Um, he was very much a person of the church. And so when Luther started to make 
his positions known and they ran into trouble and they ran thing into trouble mainly on the the uh, bound bound will as Luther liked to call it. So, but look what Luther says to Abbot Rasmus here. Moreover, I praise and commend you highly for this also, that unlike all the rest, you alone have attacked the real issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got the Pope and you've got these radical reforms. Luther says, they're not getting at the heart of the matter. Rasmus, you have. You've attacked me on the heart of the matter. The essence of the matter in dispute and have not wearied me with irrelevancies about papacy, purgatory, yeah, indulgences, yeah, yeah. and such like trifles, he said. For trifles, they are rather than basic issues, with which almost everyone hitherto has gone hunting for me without success. You and you alone have seen the question on which everything hinges and have aimed at the vital spot, for which I sincerely thank you, since I'm only too glad to give as much attention to this subject as time and leisure permit. If those who have attacked me hitherto had done the same, and if those who now boast of new spirits and new revelations would still do it, we should have less of sedition and sex and more peace. Sex. <laughs> sex. You know what I meant. You know what I said. Sorry. That didn't sound right. And more of peace and, and concord. But God has, in his way through Satan, punished our ingratitude. So, so, um, so he speaks very highly of, and so everything hinges on this. So, so a little bit on Luther's bondage of the will is he said, Luther said, like one of his things that was worthwhile, but obviously he wrote a lot that was worthwhile, but it's very thick and very hard to get at. Um, so I'll give you very basic summary. Luther argues that when it comes to God, a person is completely in bondage, cannot choose the good or improve one situation. That includes, and this is where we have we have a loving, you know, kind of thing with our more radical reformer like Pentecostals and Baptists and non-denominationals that really want to say that if you have faith, you've made a decision. And Lutherans are like, you know, we're nervous about that decision thing. That sounds an awful lot like us doing it <laughs> um now baptists don't see it that way of course so we have to be be gracious and kind to each other on this but but erasmus said that you have to have faith but you have to cooperate that faith and do good works and you have can do good works he would say to luther luther why did god give the law in the first place if we can't keep it because luther said you, you can't keep it if you're honest we're we're stuck we're and and so they had this battle, which is very much about Paul um, and how you understand and interpret Paul. Um, so um, those of you who did grow up Lutheran and did go to catechism and you had your third article of the Apostles' Creed, where Luther says the meaning of the third article of the creed is that I cannot by my own reason or a strength come to believe, but only as a gift of the Holy Spirit, working through the word, et cetera. So that's the bondage of the will. We God, need we is. need the word preached. We we cannot like get our like we don't have it within us to have faith without outside. And I think Baptists would say the same thing if we really uh, got down to it. But it does come out in this difference where we're going to be a little more cautious about our less confident. Let's put it that way in our human decision to choose. Christ and make a decision, make a personal decision, as is sometimes the language. We love to go to Jesus where he says, I chose you, you didn't choose me. Um, so, and there's stuff about predestination involved in all this, but I won't go, we don't have time to, to we, we can in the bus be talking about all this stuff <laughs> at, at length. Um, but it sets the stage for the uh, solas. Okay, so if you, solas are the alones. Word alone, grace alone, Christ alone, scripture alone, this type of thing. Um, so uh, that's important. Um, and it's countercultural. I think uh, this is important to put up that it doesn't, our American is all about do it yourself, right? And we wonder why a certain kind of Christianity has flourished here in this land. Well, you know, Lutherans are like, you can't do it yourself. And Americans are like, Yes, I can. Just do it. I did it my way, and I I pulled myself up on my bootstraps. And in the left-hand kingdom, that's great. 
But when it comes to Christ, you you can't. You, it's a passive righteousness. It's a gift. And that's where he mentioned it. So, so there's my quick little, you know, there's Erasmus. There's a big, that Luther felt like this was the thing. Um, if you want to listen to a podcast that's based on a book about the bondage of the will, uh, go to uh, 1517 Network Outlaw God. It's called The Outlaw God. It's by Stephen Poulsen and Caleb something. And each week they talk about it. It's a And it's based on Stephen Poulsen's three-volume work on Luther's bondage of the will and his debate with Erasmus. And... I think they've taken two years or three years to get through volume one of the three volumes. So it's very thick. Um, sometimes I listen to it and I'm just like, oh, they nailed this right on. And sometimes it's over my head. But uh, if you really want to do that, that's a great resource. But let's talk about marriage. So the other thing that happens that's important, I guess I have no place to put us here without putting on a cover up key. Um, so as you know, because of Luther's point about the monastic tradition, a lot of people were leaving the monasteries, and and that was true of the nunneries as well. And there were a lot of nuns that they were the, the monasteries were shutting down, and so a lot of nuns. I think I told you already that some of the reformers had to keep ended up being one of their biggest challenges was finding husbands for all these nuns who were no longer nuns and because a lot of times they became nuns because their family could not support them mm -hmm. so they couldn't raise so now we've got a just a down to earth we got to take care of these gals um and a group of nuns came to wittenberg um they escaped in i think it was herring barrels mm -hmm. yeah yeah um they put them each one in herring barrels put them in a big cart and they escaped and so they show up <laughs> smelling lovely <laughs> but i think one of those was katie i can't remember i think so and uh katie was very strong and she said i'll either marry luther or this guy and that's it you're not <laughs> and luther tried to have her marry this other guy and she's nope anyway Martin and Katie got married in 1525 when Luther is 43. Of course, you can imagine that Rome said, aha, see, that's what this was all about in the first oh, place. Yeah. He couldn't, you know, couldn't handle celibacy. And so um, uh, that, of course, wasn't the case. Uh, um, but Luther gets married to Catherine von Bora. And she is an amazing woman of the Reformation. Uh, I, uh, this is what Melanchthon said. I have hopes that this state of life, marriage, will sober him down. And that he will discard the low buffoonery with which we have often censured. <laughs> uh, uh, this, is, this is Luther from Table Talk. Okay, this is where people were writing down what he said at dinner, supposedly. Man has estranged thoughts in the first year of marriage. When sitting at table, he thinks, before I was alone, now there are two. Or in bed. When he wakes up, he sees a pair of pigtails lying beside him, which he hadn't seen before. <laughs> Love it. Now, this is the, this is, whoops, um, let's see. Oh, yeah, this is, I love that one. It says, but this is um, really important. This is from Lowell's book um, uh, on, on, and Nelson's book. Nelson was the student. Lowell passed away, um, and Nelson finished the book. Um, but this is really important a theological point I want to make about the Reformation, about Luther getting married, about a, a different way of looking at what is it, what does the godly Christian life look like? And Luther is going to be all about the neighbor and relationships. He's not going to be about pulling away from creation life. He's earthy down to earth. And so this is beautifully said by these guys. Gone was the medieval idea of fleeing the body to free the soul. Now, that's just come right back around today. The whole New Age movement that is now kind of uh, totally defunct. Go to Oak Creek Canyon, go to Sedona in Arizona. <laughs> it's alive and well. Get out of your body. Shirley MacLaine's, you know, 
out on a limb, you know, all this. We got to get out of this earthly body, which is kind of a Gnostic problem. Anyway, I won't go down that road and explain all that. But so like monasticism, I got to, no relations, no, I'm going to be celibate. I'm going to not have all kinds of material wealth. I'm going to, you know, withdraw. So that was the ideal. Within God intended limits, flesh was good, sex to be enjoyed, family life to be honored, food to be relished. As a Lutheran, we get to relish good food and not feel bad about it. And good beer. <laughs> if, if alcohol is not a problem, you know, for you. So, uh, you know, and the physical stuff of life to be appreciated as a gift from God that it was. I think that's really beautifully said. And Luther getting married was all about that. And that's what he realized. He, you know, um, I love what he says about Katie. I am rich, said Luther. My God has given me a nun and has added three <laughs> children. I don't worry about my debts for when my Katie has paid them, there will be more. <laughs> Katie, Katie, Got his house in order. Yeah. She was the businesswoman. Luther he couldn't keep things straight. And she started making wine and beer and had, you know, people at the, you know, you'll see in, in uh, Wittenberg. I'm sure we'll walk down. I don't know what's being remodeled there in Wittenberg right now, but we'll see the monastery. I think we'll probably get to go down and see some of the old wine vats and all of that. Oh, oh Mark is Mark is gonna <laughs> rush it. <laughs> that relish, but uh, well, well we are relishing, but within limits. <laughs> I remember see it says right there. Anyway, for sure. yes, for, for sure. sure. So um, I love this too. He says about Katie, I wouldn't give up my Katie for France or for Venice. First, because God gave her to me and gave me to her. I think it's a beautiful understanding of marriage right there. Mm -hmm. Second, because I have often observed that other women have more shortcomings than that. Although she too has some shortcomings. Oh yeah, although she too has some, but they are outweighed by her oh, many great virtues. Okay. Well, I wonder what she would say about him. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, and third, because she keeps faith in marriage, that is fidelity and respect. That's table talk. So that's cool. All right, we did, we did, we did Erasmus. Um, oh, I guess I accidentally did that. Okay, we already did free will. We got that. Um, this is the Pope that comes after uh, Pope Leo the Tenth. Only a couple years, but look what Pope Adrian says in the midst of the fervor. Now, 1521. You know, the Diet of Worms has happened, I believe, and, and uh, you know, you've got all this stuff going on. We all, prelates and clergy, have gone astray from the right way, and for long, there is none that has done good. She probably should have too long. There is none that has done good. No, not one. We shall use all diligence to reform before all things the Roman Curia, whence perhaps all these evils have their origin, thus healing will begin at the source of the sickness. Mm -hmm. Now that's optimistic. That's that's yeah. cool. So I, I don't want you to get the sense that there was just zero interest in reforming the church from the Roman curate or from the Pope. Now Pope Leo probably, but the popes to come, they're like, yeah, he's he was right about some things. And the Catholic Church still would probably say that. Mm -hmm. But of course they are just wanting to fix the system mm -hmm. and luther ends up like no the whole the whole system is problematic um and that's and that's part of the problem so okay so that's important stuff but, yeah please but please. that quote is is quite optimistic i mean yeah I, more yeah. so than the previous pope who had uh, burning to stay exactly and had no interest mm -hmm. but did you say he wasn't a pope that long uh, just a couple of years. That's oh, all. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so that's, and of course, they all have really good pictures of themselves. Right? It's really, we have, we can see what they look like. Um, Were the Pope's lifetime until they died, even way back then? Yeah. Yeah. I think Pope Benedict was like the first, one of two popes in the history of popes that actually quit before they died. Mm. Yeah, it just was, that's just not unheard of and, uh, that what and, he did, yeah. which I don't disparage him for doing that. But yeah, you so so when you see a pope 
is done, that means he died. He's done. Yeah, he died. He actually <laughs> finished his sojourn on earth. <laughs> Even if they do produce right on sentences like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, 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 well, then, my then, English then, teachers would kill me for writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a translation, so I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, know, what, I don't right. know what the Latin is. <laughs> um, okay. Questions about anything so far? Okay, we're going to get to uh, just a few other little things here. So, so another thing that's going on that I just want to front load and have you just be aware of. So when you get there, some of this and and I love that we have a book. Can I see that book real quick? Uh, that gives us some of the things in some of the places because I might actually curate some of this. I'm hoping to have a little bit of Luther for you when when you go. That for each day. You know, we'll have a little, not a big long reading by Luther, but a little reading that will coincide with that place to some degree. So I'm, I'm going to try and do that. This might be helpful. I know this book also in the back has the places that you visit today. So, um, so again, yeah. So that's cool. But one of the, you can imagine that now that the Reformation is going, we got to decide how we're going to train pastors. Mm -hmm. How are we going to train? How are we going to administrate? You know, we the You've heard me talk about the right hand and the left hand kingdom, the right hand being the kingdom of Christ, forgiveness of sins, the Lord's Supper, the, you know, the gospel. And then the left hand kingdom is civil matters and civic matters. Well, the left hand, the church lives in the world. So we got to figure out something here. And, you know, how do you choose leaders? You know, how do you? And so most of the pastors at the beginning were people that were trained in the normal seminaries and and for the Catholic uh, Church. Yeah, for the Catholic Church. And then now they're going with the Reformation. Yeah. So um, but how do we train up new people now? And this is all something that has to be started kind of from the from the ground up. Um unfortunately, and I think this is a real unfortunate thing, but if if we don't we can't depend on Rome and the whole system there to train up pastors and to do administration who are we going to go to well they went to the civic leaders and then what do you got happening A merger of church and civic stuff even though luther had a real strong sense that these are two different things so so later what you're going to hear as we you look at Re reformation history and the 30 years war that came after this is that if a prince went um, what was this, the agreement? I forget the name of this agreement. But if the prince went Reformation, everybody went Reformation. Mm -hmm. If the prince went oh. Catholic, everybody the Catholic. The prince of that little area? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, or the elector, I should Whatever. say, yeah, yeah. I don't, they didn't always call them princes, but majesty, they had different mm -hmm. words. But, but so, so whoever was civic in charge got to say what the land mm -hmm. was going to do. What the way it was that was the peace of Augsburg, that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. It's the way to is that that was what was decided, which you know, not a good good way to go necessarily. And unfortunately, what that means is it sets up where you've got wars going on that you know, you in our more recent time, we have the Protestants and the Catholics in Ireland and and you know, fighting it out. Well. You had some of that going on within the Holy Roman Empire, or what was the Holy Roman Empire, because, you know, well, we're, you know, and the same thing happened in England. So you had different kings or queens who were either partial to the Reformation or against the Reformation, and people's heads rolled over that. Um, in fact, Henry VIII, what, what was his last? One of his his last wife. <laughs> I know. Oh, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine, yeah. Catherine, Aragon. Catherine was amazing. You should look into her. Um, she <laughs> she was a total sympathetic to the Reformation. You read some of her writings, which not are hard Aragon. To get... She was the first. Oh no, oh, not was the, she first. the first. So Catherine. Oh, Maybe, I maybe think Catherine, Catherine sounds Catherine right, and it was one of the last, of if not the last, oh, right. was, it might even be the last wife. Oh, um, <laughs> and because yes, Henry VIII was against the Reformation, yeah. he did Luther and him went, you know, uh, and had big battles. So, 
But yeah, which one is Casey? But she was which one is Casey? <laughs> but she the cool thing about her is she had enough political savvy savvy to know just how far to push it. And she had a lot of influence. But the Reformation eventually comes into the Anglican Church yes. in a big way. Um, there's a podcast called The White Horse Inn, which uh, is a cool podcast. It's by Reformed folks and Anglican priests, and um, there's a Lutheran in there as well. But evidently, the White Horse Inn in England was a place where the Reformation ideas came, and so they call their podcast The White Horse Inn, which is kind of fun. Um, so... Now, though, we've got this administration issue, and they're trying to scramble, trying to figure that out, and it's kind of chaotic. But then Luther also goes to um, areas around now that are going with the Reformation, that are open to it, um, and he's trying to see what the status is. Um, and he's absolutely blown away by the ignorance of the population. They've just never been taught anything. One, they can't read, which is a problem. But but two, they don't even know what the Christian faith is. It's superstition. They go to mass. They get the 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 you know the. It's in a foreign language. It's in a foreign language, and it's just they're just absolutely they don't understand. They don't know the faith at all. So that's what prompts what some of you studied when you were kids. <laughs> Yeah, every the, Saturday. The, the every Saturday, yeah. For two but, years. For two years, years. yeah. Hard for you guys. Oh, memorizing, boy. Sleepovers the night before were all us Lutherans practicing our catechism. Yes. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Luther wrote two catechisms. Uh, the, so the need was, you know, there. Um, and he, he looks to Bugenhagen, and his pastor, and to Justice Jonas and John Agricola. These are other reformers, other people, Wittenbergers, you might call them. Um, although John Agricola will become a real problem. Um, first, so he first addressed it through a series of sermons on the parts of the catechism. Luther did not invent, invent those parts of the catechism. Those are part of the church. That tradition, so he kind of held on to that process, but that's when he writes the small and large catechism. The small catechism, if, for those of you who don't know, um, is uh, what Luther wrote for parents to use to teach their kids the faith. It became the curriculum for pastors to teach seventh and eighth graders, <laughs> um, but it was intended for moms and dads to take out at the dinner table and teach the faith, which it's still, it would be good for us to do. Um, he wrote the large catechism for adults. It's got some amazing, awesome things in it, but you have to, and this is always the case, if you just go about start reading Luther, um, I'm, I'm curating some things for you, but you have to understand the negativity towards Rome and the, they're they're throwing bombs at each other all the time, so you have to kind of get through the that um, because it it's off putting I think to a lot of folks and to a lot of us whether it's to his people on the left the radical reformers or the, the or Rome it's got a lot of invective is that a word is that right am I yes what's what's what wants to come into my mind it's got a lot of that so you have to kind of go. Okay, Luther, and then get at what he's really saying, which is really awesome. Okay, and so the large catechism is really great. One of the best parts of the large catechism is on the first commandment, where Luther says what it is to have a God. You know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the large catechism makes it clear that whatever your heart entrusts itself to is your God. So if you trust money, that's your God. I have an engraved chess very old from somebody that's engraved where thy heart is there shall thy treasure be ah, and yeah. where, where's that from yeah well that's a quote from jesus yeah, yeah but what what book is it do you know it's in it's in both i think it's in all three of matthew mark and Luke. Okay. yeah okay. no where your heart is there your treasure will be where your treasure is there your heart will be yes yeah right yeah right right, right, right. yeah, yeah i back. sometimes mix that up yeah, me but it's really cool that jesus says where you put your treasure that's where your heart's going to be part of the sermon on the mount i think it is in the matthew oh. yeah 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 um yeah so great stuff there um all right so that's 
that's the catechism chapter and getting th getting educated. Like I told you, and I'm probably stealing the thunder of our tour guide because I know they like to tell folks this that you know the literacy rate just skyrockets with the reformation. You know, that, that, <clears throat> yeah, I know that you talked about the literacy rate and how quickly it accelerated yeah. and, and grew. I have trouble believing it could grow that fast. I know it's yeah, hard in those believe. days. You know, it's, it's not hard. like they had. Internet and all these other ways to hear it. Yeah. And read it. But, yeah. Is, but isn't it true that the printing press yes. was going, yeah. was in operation yeah. and going before? But they were incredibly crude printing press. Yes. They weren't, okay. Right. Public. But now people have a motivation yeah. to yeah. read. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. all this stuff is out there. They don't have to. I'm like, I don't want to listen to that person tell me what it says. I want to read it for myself. So, so now they have there's the books. System there's books. There. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I think it may not have just been Luther and Melanchthon, although they were all about educating people and helping them, you know, and they had schools Their and content and things. universities and stuff. But now the average person is like, ah, wow, I can actually get a book and read it. You know? Wasn't there a, a great investment in making sure your children could read? I'm sure they were for the future. Yeah, and great. in the process of them learning, the parents learn too. Yeah, you know, the probably. parents had to demand education yeah. systems that could do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know how they could all teach it yeah. themselves. Yeah, yeah. But so when he's not in isolation anymore, he's come back out and was involved with the church again. He is at this point. After it's only about nine months after the Diet of Worms that he has to hide out, and he says, "I can't stand it anymore," and he goes back and he just takes the risk. And it's a great question. So, and now he's protected by the elector mm -hmm. and by other people. Everybody's favorable to it. But that's a great setup to the Diet of Augs Augsburg. And we will be in Augsburg. Good place. Um, at 1530. Um, he can't go there, Andrew, because mm -hmm. he, it's outside yeah. of the same zone. It's exactly yeah. right. And it drives him nuts. Are you sure we're going to be in Augsburg? Yeah, I, oh, we're not going to be in Augsburg. That is in the part, the Catholic part of Germany. Oh, I started there, so we won't be in. We won't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Augsburg is still in the very much Catholic part of Ger yeah. Germany. Yeah. Down yeah. south is more ca Catholic. Yeah. Further north, so we're not in okay. Augsburg. Okay. Well, well, that's all right. Um, yes. Regarding Luther dipping in and out of his interest and attention to the Reformation. Yeah. Part of it was because he was, had to be protected and couldn't be active in it. Right. Was, there are parts that he just got bored with and didn't want to deal with it yeah. anymore. Um, I think that's true to some extent. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But I don't know that he ever, I think he just got, I think it was more just he got run ragged just with mm -hmm. the limits of what one human being can do. Sure. I mean, sure. he had people coming to him because now he's the hero. And people want him to solve what, all right. kinds of problems, you know. Um, um, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, you know, the as the as he as Luther joked, I forget. It's towards the end of his life when he's having horrible kidney stones. Um, you know, painful, painful mm -hmm. childbirth kind of. You know, <laughs> as the, at least that's what I've been told. It's like that. Um, <laughs> they're bad, and he's and he said one of them. He one trip he had to take to go and deal with some controversy that is happening. The road was just pulled in. And he says it he thinks right. it just launched the kidney stone and he survived. <laughs> so um so it saved his life, type of thing. And maybe that maybe it did. Um, but um yeah, so and then he actually died the place that he ended up dying, he was there trying to solve a dispute, a civil dispute among so he gets pulled into everything. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, but I and so yeah, yeah, but yeah, I think it's more just the limits of what one person can do, which still I can't even fathom what he accomplished. So, so yeah, good, good. Okay, so he writes small, and large catechism. So now let's there's the Holy Roman Empire again. You see that, and let's talk about the Diet of Oxford, and then we'll finish. Um, Diet of Oxford, <laughs> um, yes. So you, well, where's, uh, do I have it? Mm -hmm. Augsburg is what? Do down in here. Yeah. Right, down in here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, when I went there, I started, I took a train from Munich, no, 
It's, it's Munich. close to Munich. Yeah, so I took a train from really Munich close. to Oxford. And the train station, you know, there's a million trains in this train station. You know, it's like, <laughs> wow, I've never seen anything like this. It's so cool. And I found somebody that could speak a little English. And I said, okay, which train is the one to Oxford? And, and anyway, I got, I missed my first train. And then I waited and I got, and I was like just sweating buckets Praying that I heard Augsburg <laughs> over the loudspeaker. Yeah. I was convinced I was off to who knows where. <laughs> but uh, I made it. My family still thinks it's one of the great miracles that I survived <laughs> for a, a, a two weeks. Yeah. And then they came. I, okay. I was there for two weeks and then they came for another four or five days for the end of my trip. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I made it to Augsburg. I rented a car and then I drove the Audubon and I did it. It's a miracle. Um, so anyway, so um, by this time, uh, and again, I we've got one more free trip meeting, so we we only have so much time. But I want to get you at least next week. We'll next Sunday we'll talk about uh, Luther's end of his life. A little bit of what happens afterwards. We'll talk a little bit about. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that today. Um, uh, what Luther, unfortunately, is known for his invective and his really harsh comments about yeah. the Jews of his day. Mm -hmm. So we need to have you properly prepared for that. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing to run from. Nothing, you know, is mm -hmm. important that we know about this. But um, so that's what we'll do either in the last bit of our time today or um, next time. But what... You, the Augsburg Diet, remember diet is a convention, uh, was called to deal with the Reformation. Because now you got all these electors and princes that are favorable to the Reformation. Not all of them. Some of them were dire enemies of Luther. And probably they were smart because Luther's look at this really drained them of some power, truthfully. But nonetheless... There are a lot of folks who get it. They are on board with Luther's insights and getting the church back to preaching the gospel, the word, et cetera. And they are all on board. And they are sincerely Christian people who are on board for the Reformation. And so um, there was one last gasp, one last chance. And Luther had always asked, hey, let's have a big... Um, what, what do you call Vatican II, Vatican I? Those are called um, councils or whatever. He wanted that. He really believed, let's get this together. We'll solve these theological issues. He, he believed that in the beginning of his life, the last part of his life, he, he had given up hope that that was going to do anything. But the, the Diet of Augsburg, um, and remember, Luther dies, you know, 10, 15, 15 years later or so. But the Diet of Augsburg is the pivotal moment for the Reformation, for the Lutheran Reformation. Um, but before that, there are a couple other diets that mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know about. It's not the Mediterranean diet. It's <laughs> the uh, Diet of Spire. Um, and it's at that diet that we get the word Protestant. Mm -hmm. Protest. Because at the Diet of Spire, that group of people, they were protesting certain things within the church, and they were called protesters, Protestants. So that's what a Protestant is, and that's really the origin of that. And so there are that diet and others were trying to resolve these issues. Remember, we've got, uh, let's see, who did, uh, I'll get a little, remember we got these folks that we're worried about. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Got a menu on his head. We've got the Turks um, uh, that are bearing down on Europe and about ready to overrun things. And the emperor is worried about them. Mm -hmm. And so let's get all these theological bickering figured out. And so they have these diets to try and work out these things. As well, like the Diet of Worms wasn't just about Luther. In fact, it was all about what was going on in the empire. And it just so happened that, okay, we're going to deal with Luther at this time too. So it wasn't all about Luther. It was about all kinds of other things. From the emperor's standpoint, probably way more important. Um, so, so you've got the problem of the Turks going on, and we got to get these 
you got to try and come up with a, a resolution. And so at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, um, they used writings that were from prior diets that, that were trying to get at this. But Man Melanchthon takes all the work that had been done by Luther, other reformers, and he composes something called the Augsburg Confession. Hmm. Sometimes talked about as Augustana. You've heard of Augustana University schools, Lutheran schools, that's where it gets its name, Augustana from the Augsburg Confession. Um, you can look up the Augsburg Confession, you can read it. I maybe I you know what I'll do? I'll put it on the web page. Uh, I'll just cut cut and paste it into a Word document to put it there. It's long, but it's not that long. One Catholic theologian said, This is just the Christian faith. But no, there, there, there's some places of real rubbing and disagreement, so much so that immediately the Catholic Church takes their best people to write up uh, against it, and then Melanchthon has to write a defense and all this. And then actually then there's some changes to it, and a lot of the real Lutheran Lutherans got upset that Melanchthon messed around with it. And, you know, it gets just really interesting, but... The Augsburg Confession is the, um, it's really what holds the Lutheran movement together. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's a bigger book called The Formula of Concord because reformers, Luther and others, they're going to, everybody starts disagreeing. It's like, we got to, we got to Concord, Concordia Colleges, mm -hmm. you've heard about, mm -hmm. we got to have Concord. Let's not have all this disagreement. So the Formula of Concord is this big book of confessional writings, but within that is the Augsburg Confession. And that is really, Luther said, yes, Melanchthon, you nailed it. Luther will write some uh, small called articles is what he called them, his kind of own conf Augsburg Confession, very similar, but he's very happy with what Melanchthon does. And it's taken, it's taken to the Diet of Augsburg and guess who's there? The emperor is there, and all the princes come, and they present this at the risk of their own lives. But, of course, the emperor doesn't want to revolt. He's got the Turks. He's got to worry about it. So he hears them. He accepts it. They give it. He doesn't really accept it as such, but it's given, and they go their way, and it was this crucial historic moment. It's where the Luther movie that Joseph Fiennes uh, stars in ends. That they present this to the emperor and they're not killed and they kind of like what do we do with it i get are they okay with it but soon they'll see that they didn't weren't okay with it and but the you really need to know about the oxford confession questions we'll talk about the church now there's some really fun stuff here <laughs> um so uh, who is i forget who this guy is so let me Suleiman. Suleiman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Luther's work with the problem of the Turk is really fascinating. Um, so Luther talks about the need to confront the Turkish invasion on two fronts. Temporal Emperor Charles Christians may serve, but not as holy war, but responsibility of being a member of the empire. So this is where Luther will come in with his two kingdoms view. Because the, the real um, radical reformers said, you can never take up arms and kill someone because you're a Christian. You can't do that. Hacksaw Ridge, the movie that Clint Eastwood I guess directed is about someone from an Anabaptist tradition from a more radical reformist tradition that he could not fight, but he went in as a medic and went Ryan. It's just an absolutely amazing story. Um, and you have to tip your hat a hundred times to, you know, that, but Luther didn't have that because he said, no, as, as a Christian person, I have responsibility in the left-hand kingdom. It might be that I'm a police officer at today. I mean, there are, and I have to take someone's life because of, well, you don't have to kill yourself about that because you're a Christian. You're doing your duty. And if you did it, you know, in a just cause and to protect someone's life or stop someone from injury, you know, that's, if you're a soldier and you're at war, well, 
You're, that's going to be a part of that. So, so Luther said, no, as a member of the empire, as a citizen, I can go fight the Turk, take up arms. As a, as a, I don't know if he'd use the word citizen, but that's what we would say today. I'm a person of this country and I'm defending my country and I have every right to take up arms and go in, even though I'm a Christian, because that's a different kingdom. You don't solve problems in the church, though, by taking up arms and, you know, wiping people out. So you don't do that. So this is the fascinating thing. that. But then Luther will say that um, when it comes, he also would say about the church, I don't know if I've got it on here. Not, um, yeah. Um, so he'll say, he'll say um, God gave us the church because of our sin. It's, it's God's punishment Ooh. about the lack of the gospel in the secular world that this so what's the right response to the turk repent get back to you know the true faith and then god will resolve this issue even though he's and but luther felt that it was fine that if you needed to protect the country you could go and serve in them as a soldier etc that's one that's but then he said very clearly <clears throat> I, if i were to go and fight the turk i wouldn't be doing it as a christian if, he, if this is literally a quote i don't think i grabbed it for this presentation but he said if a bishop or priest was carrying a cross and leading me into battle against the turk i would run the other way because I don't kill a Muslim in behalf of Christ. Never. It's this is the problem. Now, even though today with radical Islam, they see the United States as a Christian nation, and so they see it as a religious war. Really, any no Christian should ever go into battle saying, I'm defending Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. You're defending your nation. That's the left-hand kingdom. And as a citizen of that, you you are called to do that. <clears throat> but you don't do it. I'm not taking Christ into, you know, and no, 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 no. That's, that's, we, he does, he's not a holy war guy. Um, that's <laughs> confusing the kingdoms. Now, I, I don't think he would say that you might not be doing God's will because God's will is, to have a place that Christianity can flourish and Islam kind of takes over everything. So he wouldn't say you might, you're not doing God's will by defending your country or going to war, but you got to be careful there. You know, it's, it's a difference. Does that make, is that making some sense? I think that's cool because Luther transcends this whole sense of holy war. You don't fight, kill somebody in the name of Christ, you know, so repent, the Turk problem is repentance. Um, I mentioned how you can serve. But then he also says this, which is from a spiritual side now, Islam. Not just thinking about the Turks, because the Ottoman Turks were the you know force of Islam at the time. The Turk is also a papist, a papist. Why? How? Wait, wait, wait. It's a Muslim, not a <laughs> Christian Catholic. For he believes that he will become holy and saved by works. Mm. So he saw Islam as another branch of the whole works righteousness thing. Is that it, Islam is very much that? Mm -hmm. So, so that I think is really fascinating and cool. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Um, thank you for your time. <laughs> um, so, so those are some really more logs for the fire, more stuff for thinking before we finish today. And so next time we will talk about Luther's end of life, what happens a little bit afterwards. Um, and then uh, his, any other little practical great questions? We, if you were not here at Tuesday night, re look at the recording because Paul asked some great questions and other people chimed in with some really good practical Did things. talk about money? Mm -hmm. We Nothing did. Hours. We did. So watch that. And, and, I and transportation to and from the airport. That's taken care of. Okay. Oh, no. We did not. not talk about that from here, from on this side to the, to the, the airport. Land. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll watch so, and then see. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. but where we left that is that if you need, if you want to team up, 
I think Tom and Marilyn have still some. Uh, no, but, no, you're, well, you're full. With us and, okay. And business okay, so you guys are We're set. Um, and then I think, did you guys say you had some room or who, who was We're there? We're probably going to get a ride from our son who's yeah. sitting us, so we won't have Brian. room. Oh, it's Julie and Brian that have room. might have room. So, okay. Okay. so if you want to talk to them, we might have room for one, so you can reach out to me as well. Yeah, yeah. How are the people in North Carolina doing? Yeah, you know, I don't know. And I need to just specifically find their email and the uh -huh. email group and the email. Did she email you just specifically? No, that no, was she answered that was back. Email. We got I yeah, didn't think, we I don't remember getting that. But I do know that my friend who lives in that same area now has the internet, only got the internet this week. Okay, <laughs> wow. Yeah. And power, which is several weeks okay. different, but only the internet this week. Who has the Luther movie? Anybody? Can we own it? Well, I know we, we have her copy. Have, have her copy. Oh, we were all set to watch it the other Couldn't day. Couldn't get the sound. We can't figure out. So uh, Mark wants to watch it at our house, but maybe Mark, if your if your DVD works, we'll come to watch it. Your <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of need an old DVD player because well, we have. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. But somehow we don't have it working on this. Mark, I'd like to see that. Yeah, that part. you would you would want yeah. to see that. Well, yeah. we'll get moving on it. Right okay. Now. Yeah. If, yeah. She talked about getting um, euros at uh, AAA. AAA. Okay. It does take three to five days so for it to it come tomorrow. in. Do it tomorrow. So, tomorrow. so if you want to do, and they're only open Monday through Friday. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, if, if you're going to do that, don't wait Is too long. Charge for and who's got there? there was, it was um, if you ordered two hundred dollars, there was no no. Other fee than the five dollars okay. for them to do it. Yeah. The euros. Then it was France. ten dollars yeah. for okay. if you didn't do two hundred. For I went to so, my bank. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, I did. You no, know, Debbie. I, I don't yeah. think I'd worry about it. Too. No, yeah. you don't need much. Somebody's yeah. gonna be around. Well, I just saw so we just put our in that right. German doesn't like credit, credit cards. cards. Is that no, right? that's not true. Okay. But, but for any kind D, of little D, things, D, you know how like we would D, go in a that, store and, and use this was, get a cup of mm -hmm. coffee. Right, and right. It, it, it's getting used. They're starting to do that, but it's still better if they have. Sorry, we'll have Euro. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. But, but you can get them at the Frankfurt Airport. No, I'll show you. That. Oh, okay. with you and show Oh, that's you right. <laughs> We're going to have two hours in the Frankfurt Airport, and it's not yeah. going to take us that long to get through okay. their borders. It was Sandy's father. And how about the waterproof shoes? I haven't gotten mine yet. Okay. Have other people? You just what? Get a waterproof tennis shoes. <laughs> yeah. He won't shoot there to walk around out here in the great northwest. Yeah, what do you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, no, is that that's the first there. thing I've been worrying about. That. Well, <laughs> I'm not got, worrying. I know, but I would have we're going to be likely boarding likely streams. So likely, yeah, we, but yeah. but maybe the water. Through, it's it's likely to rain. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 kind of like it does here. Just yeah, like exactly. Here. Like here. Here. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very similar. And of course, now you know it won't rain the whole time. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Let's finish, and I'll we'll head out. Thank you, God, for this great conversation. We're so excited to be together um, and uh, go on this journey together. So we pray your blessing on our preparation. Um, hold it all before you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Henry VIII's last wife.